Thank you. And thank all of you for coming. Joseph Ratzinger was born on April 16th, 1927. That day happened to be the vigil of Easter Sunday, Holy Saturday. Born in Martelam Inn in Bavaria, uh, about 4 in the morning, 4.30 in the morning. In those days, before the restoration of the Easter liturgy, which took place before Vatican Council II, uh, Easter Vigil could be as early as Saturday morning, and sure enough, in that little town, it was. And so at 8.30 a.m., his mother brought him to the church for the Easter Vigil, and he was baptized. Uh, he always looked upon this as a symbolic event. His natural birth occurred, and his supernatural birth occurred in the heart of the Christian liturgy, uh, the Holy Week, the Taker Trudum. And that marked him for his whole life, and that's why the center of his life, as I'll mention, one of his great books, uh, actually written as a book, which most of us were not. Uh, they're rather collections of essays and homilies and so on. Uh, the Spirit of the Liturgy, which I believe became the great book, if not the greatest book of all time on the Mass. So when his life was ebbing and we knew that he was uh, not much longer of this world, I had a premonition really that he would die on, on a symbolic date just like he was born on a symbolic date. And sure enough, he died on December 31st, which has a secular sim symbol because it's the end, it's the completion of the year, a complete year, rounded off, that's the time of the end. But it's also the vigil of Mary, the mother of God. So he's born on the vigil of the resurrection, and he dies on the vigil of Mary, the mother of God. And I believe his life was real, of course, we know it was real, it was also symbolic. I mean, he, he will remain, I believe, a symbol, symbolic figure in the church for centuries to come, if God gives us more centuries. I'm not sure about that. Uh, he, he may owe Sodom and Gomorrah an apology, as my friend John Galton used to say. <laughs> also, two days after his death, we celebrate January 2nd, we celebrate the feast of Saints Basil and Gregory of Nazianzen. Uh, they were very close friends. They were both bishops, fathers and doctors of the church. And Basil's brother, uh, Gregory of Nyssa, was also a father of the church and a doctor of the church. And they lived and they taught and they administered their dioceses uh, in the fourth century, which is one of the most turbulent centuries in the history of the church. You may have read Newman's book, The Arians of the Fourth Century. That was when more than half the bishops defected, really, and went along with Arius' ideas. And even Liberius was uh, signed a very ambiguous document, to say the most, to say the least. Uh, so it was a difficult time. These three men were friends. They'd gone to school together. Uh, they were mystical in their theology, but also practical. And they became, as I say, fathers and doctors of the church. I believe that in the centuries to come, we'll look back on three men as fathers and doctors of the church. Let me read this little statement from Benedict's uh, autobiography, Milestones, published by Ignatius Press, if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> Meeting with Balthazar was for me the beginning of a lifelong friendship. I can only be thankful for. Never again have I found anyone with such a comprehensive theological and humanistic education as Balthazar and de Lubac, those two figures, Hans von Balthazar, Henri de Lubac. And I cannot even begin to say how much I owe to my encounter with them. Uh, I mean, I can verify this from the time I spent with Carl Rassinger and Professor Rassinger, Carl Rassinger and then Pope Benedict, that he, they were very good friends, the three of them. They corresponded together frequently. Uh, and I believe that the three of them are kind of like a constellation in the, in, the, in the firmament of the 20th and early 21st century that will be remembered for a long, long time. And that's why this talk is about the legacy of Benedict. But I can't speak about the legacy of Benedict without also talking about the legacy of Henri de Dubac and Hans Wilson Balthasar. What is that legacy? De Lubac was born first, 1896. 
Uh, he was a Jesuit novice for seven years. Now, usually it takes only two years, right? Uh, but he entered the novitiate uh, just before World War I, and he spent his first year as a novice, and then he was inducted as a stretcher bearer uh, into the French military, where he served during World War I for five years, and then he had a second year in the novitiate after the war. Uh, it wasn't because he was a slow learner, uh, because he was defending his country. But he was injured very seriously. He had a terrible injury to his ear, and it affected him for the rest of his life. So much so that when he was studying theology, he couldn't go to the lectures. And so he stayed in his room, a lot of times in bed, uh, reading the entire Patologia Graeca et Latina. That is, Minha, this great Frenchman in the, early, in the middle 19th century, gathered together all the writings of the Latin fathers of the church and the Greek fathers of the church, and he published them in this huge volume, many, many, multiple volumes, I mean, dozens of volumes. And of course, for the Greek fathers, he also put in the uh, Latin translation. But de Lubac read everything there was to read at that time about that vigorous, vital flourishing of the church in the early centuries. And of course, that led him to be a leader in, if not the originator of, what became known as the patristic revival of the 20th century. Later on, actually during World War II and before, he founded Source Chrétienne, uh, which was a long, it's still going on, there's over 300 volumes in it, where they would take these fathers of the church, sources of Christianity, and they would establish a critical text and then comment on it and have a translation of it. So they have the Greek text on one hand, on one side, and the French on the other. Uh, a m marvelous work that he did. And of course, that work was uh, part of what went into the formation of Hans Rosson Balthasar and, and Joseph Ratzinger. What are some of his books? His first major book was called Catholicism, uh, The Social Aspects of Catholic Dogma. And at that time, and still today, there's some kind of criticism that Catholicism and Christianity in general is, is all personal, me and Jesus, you know. But he shows from the earliest church, uh, from scriptures on, that that's not the case. There's always a community aspect and an outreach aspect and a helping other aspect of the Catholic faith. Uh, and that book was, was really kind of a, a Bahnbrechen, they say in German. Um, how do I say that, somebody? Uh, uh, opening a road, you know, a beginning of a, a whole movement, really, of Catholic social teaching and social taught, thought. Um, he wrote during the war uh, a book called The Drama of Atheist Humanism, and this is a magnificent, this is a classic book. Uh, what he does, after experiencing what happens with totalitarianism and man without God, he goes back to the 19th century for the roots of this. He takes three figures, Nietzsche, whom we've heard of, the overman, the superman, you know, the idea of, of God, the idea of God constraining us and uh, not allowing us, allowing us to meet our, you know, our greatest potential. We got to get rid of God. God must die that we may be gods ourselves and go beyond good and evil, you see. Then you had Feuerbach and Marx. Most people heard of Marx, obviously. Feuerbach, not so much, but Feuerbach was the, the real connecting person between Hegel's philosophy which is spiritual dialectical, and Marx, which was material dialectical. And Feuerbach was kind of the philosopher of, of the Marxism movement and had a tremendous uh, influence in the 20th century, but even it goes on today, right? And the third figure was someone most people have heard of, Auguste Comte, a Frenchman who actually was the founder of sociology and saw that as the highest science that was going to be the science of the new God, which was humanity. And all three of these figures, as de Lubac points out meticulously, uh, were trying to experiment with the idea of a humanism without God, atheist humanism, as a way of exalting man. And there were very few people in the 19th century that responded to that in a way that was effective, except there was one, Fyodor Dostoevsky. And so the second part of the book, takes Dostoevsky, especially Brothers Karamazov, to show that Dostoevsky knew this, he saw what was happening, he lived it in his own life, doubt of faith and so on, and he portrayed uh, the emptiness of atheism in his novels. 
So that's, that, that's a book which will, as I say, it's historic and classic, and I recommend it to you. Uh, after that, uh, he kept working on medieval exegesis because all his readings of the patrology, you know, led him to see that the fathers had a tremendous way of interpreting scripture, which was very fruitful uh, and, and spiritual, but also rooted in the text. But some of the fathers kind of went wild with allegories and, and making connections which really weren't there. And so it was kind of discredited in the 19th century when in Germany we had the rise of what's called the historical critical method. Uh, and that was very important. We may learn many things from that, but also became dry, abstract, academic. And it, it was not nourishing the faith often for ordinary people, but actually desiccating their faith. So de Lubac sifted through all of this patristic exegesis and showed the fundamental principle of it, which is primarily the topology of Old Testament to New. Uh, but in doing that, he basically brought back into Catholic life this idea of a spiritual understanding of sacred scripture. And this will be very important because it, it was part of the whole scriptural revival of the 20th century. So patristic revival, scriptural revival, and then, uh, of course, the young Ratzinger, who was born in 1927, as I said, uh, drew from this and used it in his whole life, and in his final work, a masterpiece of Jesus of Nazareth, he, he, he gives an example for the rest of the centuries to follow of how you integrate the genuine insights of historical critical method with the greater all-embracing spiritual understanding of scripture which the fathers bequeathed to us. So that De Lubach was instrumental in that, uh, and instrumental, as I say, in the formation of both Balthazar and Ratzinger. Uh, finally, uh, he had been silenced by the church for a while. Instead of criticizing the church, he, he wrote a book which he published as soon as he was no longer silenced called The Splendor of the Church, a magnificent work on the church. In all his works, you'll notice, he, I should have brought some examples here, is about half the page is footnotes, you know. And I went to him once, you know, and I said, you know, Father de Lubac, this is such a wonderful book. Oh, it, it, it's not me, that's just text I'm quoting. I said, yeah, yeah, that's like Rembrandt saying, those are just paints I found on a palette over there, you know. <laughs> no, but he put them together. Uh, and so I, I think he is a, a real luminary. By the way, his cause has been introduced now for canonization in the Archdiocese of Lyon, France. Now, Balthasar, I could say a lot more about. He was born in 1905. His work is the most prolific of the three. But I'll just mention the one which is kind of the central centerpiece of his work, which is his great work on theological aesthetics, theological dramatics, and theological logic. So the beautiful, the good, and the true, and he, he, he makes a point that without an understanding, a sense of beauty, you know, the true just becomes kind of calculation, and the good just becomes moralism. But if you integrate all the three transcendentals, you have a fullness of theology, which really is, is appropriate to the fullness of Christ. And of course, this had a tremendous influence on, on Joseph Ratzinger. Uh, Ratzinger himself, uh, I, I thought, I actually thought, since I came to him before, I, uh, after I came to, to Balthasar and to Lubach, as I'll tell you in a moment, uh, I thought he was a junior member of this triumvirate, you know, but he was sort of the popularizer. Uh, how mistaken I was. I mean, he's an original theologian that writes in his own style, uh, and because he spent more of his life as a teacher than either de Lubach or Balthasar, he really was, was um, gifted at communicating the deepest aspects of our faith in the simplest, most comprehensible terms. Kind of like, I, I, I liken him to St. John and St. John's Gospel. I mean, Balthasar de Lubac is more like St. Paul. I mean, it's pretty complicated in Greek and in English. Whereas, whereas John, uh, it's limpid, it's clear, it's powerful, but it's also profound. So which of the works will I mention? As I said before, most of his many works were not written as books. They were written as uh, collections of essays or conference talks he gave or homilies or something like that, articles he published in different magazines. But one of his earliest was Introduction to Christianity, which was basically the course he gave at Tubingen in 1967. And it is still a foundational work uh, if you want to understand what the meaning of the creed is. 
the only drawback to it is it was a class, and he had so much to say that he never quite finished what he wanted to say about the Holy Spirit in the church at the end, so he had to condense that. But it's still, it's a, it's a phenomenal book. Also, by the way, available at Ignatius Press. <laughs> I'll keep saying that from time to time in here. Uh, towards the middle of his life, 1990s, actually, a long story there I could tell, but no time here, uh, he wrote as a book, unusually uh, for him, The Spirit of Liturgy. He did that while he's prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith uh, over a period of nine years. And I talked to him every year about it because I was excited about that book. And when I finally came, I, I just had a victory shot because I was afraid that what he was going to say was something contrary to what I'd been thinking and saying at the time. But no, it wasn't. It was, I mean, it was exactly what I've been saying, but much better said and much better written. So that book, as I said, is a great book on the Mass, the greatest, I think, on the Mass. Also, you can get that in the press. Uh, and then finally, of course, the capstone of his life was his three volumes on Jesus of Nazareth. So these three theologians uh, are part of what is known as a communio theolog theological movement. After the council... Uh, these great theologians who had been at the council, most of them had, Balthasar had not, they founded a magazine called Concilium, which they wanted to bring forward the, the insights of the council and, and make them more accessible and, and give them more dissemination. But along with the Deluc Lubach, Bouillet, Balthasar, Rasker, you had Schillebex and Kung and some others like them. And so very early on there was a division because one group saw the council as a starting of a new church. You know, everything pre-Vatican II was somehow to be rejected. Whereas the others believed in, as Ratzinger said when he was made Pope on December 22nd, 2005, a hermeneutic, an understanding based on continuity and renewal, not on rupture. And so they found their own magazine called Comunio, and it's going to this day in, in my, I think, 13 different countries. So that's part of their legacy. It's also known as resourcement theology because it's a going back to the sources, not to reject the Middle Ages, not to reject Aquinas, not to reject Thomism, but to go back to the roots of Thomas himself in the early church and, and also bring in the insights of modern philosophy, which has truly something to say to the church. So these three authors, I think, have a common legacy, which I've labeled here as the legacy of St. Benedict, somewhere there, uh, or maybe the talk <laughs> title. Um, and it just so happens, by providential circumstance, that Ignatius Press is the primary publisher of all three authors in the English language. Now, how did that happen? <laughs> well, back in 1967, before I was ordained, I went to Santa Clara. I was taken un, in, under the wing of Father Cornelius Michael Buckley, who some of you know, great man of the church, great Jesuit. And we decided to start a program to help the poor children, poor young people in East San Jose, which was a very poorest part now, of course, uh, houses a million dollars apiece. But anyway, uh, it was poor at that time, still some relatively poor. So I went to the principal of a huge Catholic grammar school. And I said, here's, I, I want you to pick out 50 students, two criteria. Number one, they're te eighth grade students. Their teachers think they're college capable. Number two, their teachers think they're likely to drop out of high school. Those are the two criteria, because all these kids would drop out of high school after they got out of grammar school. So we got 50 kids on campus. And it was the 60s, and so I began to try and play the guitar, and I tried to, <laughs> and I, and I tried to grow a beard, and I, I was not successful at either. We started the program under the president of the university, a wonderful Jesuit father, Patrick Donahoe. And then he became provincial the year after that. And I, after we did the first year of the program, uh, I found out that my rector, Father Copeland, who was a former army chaplain, kind of a right down the, you know, your, your gig line had to be lined up perfectly. Uh, he was not happy with this beard. So I went to uh, San Francisco and visited with Father Donahoe, the provincial. I said, well, Father, I, I don't want to be a rebel. I want to be a good job. I'll shave the beard. No problem. He laughed. He said, that's okay. He said, but he, have you ever thought about going to Europe for theology? I said, no. No, you want me to think about it? Yeah, think about it. So Father Buckley, who had driven up, we drove back. And on the way back, we decided, I'm going to France. You know, that's where Father Buckley had gone. So I went to Fourvier in France. 
And there I met Father de Lubac, who was kind of shoved aside. This was the modern post-Vatican era of confusion, and he was an old-fashioned man, right? So I, I was happy to spend time. In fact, he made me, I was his secretary. He was sick for a while because of his Verdun injury. And so I, he'd dictate to me, and I'd type the things out, and he'd look at them and sign them and send off his letters. So I still have a big box of correspondence about the from de Lubac in my room. Uh, well, when it came, I remember exactly where I was standing in my, my second year of theology when I realized my provincial wanted me to go on for a doctorate. We just, I just finished serving his mass. We were standing outside the chapel, and I said, well, Father, Fon Father de Lubac, um, I have to do a doctorate. You know, what should I do it on? He said, Hans Urson Balthasar, the greatest theologian of our time and perhaps of all time. Now, de Lubac is a very measured person, a very balanced. He doesn't make, he doesn't, Exaggerate. I said, okay, that's good enough for me. Well, where should I do it? Well, where's the best place to do it? Well, there's a fine young theologian in Regensburg, Professor Ratzinger. Uh, he and I are friends. I will, I will write him on your behalf. So that's what happened. De Lubach writes to Ratzinger, and he had all kinds of people wanting to be his doctoral student. He had over 50 doctoral students, okay, over the maybe 10 years. But he accepted me because of De Lubach. So that's, that's how uh, I got to know these three great giants of the church and spent time with, with, with all of them. At the same time, uh, I had never drunk wine or beer when I was young and went to Jesuit college where it was overly, and I didn't do, I said, it's stupid to be, wake up every morning in the middle of all the, ref, you know, what's left over. Uh, so I didn't, do, I didn't, I was a driver, you know, the designated driver, but, uh, but I got to Bavaria, of course, I realized, hey, this is food, this isn't drink. <laughs> and and I, and I discovered I discovered 13 different kinds of beer not 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 brands but kind you know Bach beer double Bach beer Mersen beer Pilsen you know Weizen beer all this sort of thing well I got back to the United States and I had my first beer which you all recognize now because it's become woke and I spat it on my mouth and I said <laughs> If you're going to call this beer, I need something else to describe what I drank in Bavaria, because the two are not of the same genus, really, you know. <laughs> well, one day I was given, you know, we given a retreat to some sisters. It was question and answer period. And they said, well, Father, you, you keep quoting in Dubac and Balthasar and Ratzinger and Bouillet and Spire and everything. And who, who are the great American theologians? So I told them a story about the beer. And I said, we've got some good academics here, but if you're gonna call them theologians, I need another name for what I've experienced over in Europe. You know, it's just it's a, it's a different class. By, and that's, that's why we started Ignatius Press. We had a little reading group with my friend John Galton. I would quote these things, say, hey, Father, we gotta put this in English, because I would translate for them, you know? So that's how we started Ignatius. 19, 1979 was our first two books, Heart of the World by von Balthasar and Woman in the Church by Bouillet, who was also a friend of these three. And that became really the origin of Ignatius Press. Uh, shortly after that time, I had to make a long retreat. Jesuits go through a long formation, they used to anyway. Two years novitiate, in the first year you make a long retreat, that is to say 30 days of the spiritual exercises. And then you have a couple of years of junior eight, which is classical studies. And then you have three years of philosophy. And then two or three years of what they call Regency, which are out in the ministry, teaching in a school, something like that. And then four years of theology. And by that time, Ignatius thought, hey, you've been, you've been studying too much. Better get back to the spiritual life. And so we have a third year of novitiate called the tertianship. And you make your long retreat there. Well, by that time, by the time I got finished theology, I started teaching. This is 1974, 75. I became notorious because I believed in the creed. <laughs> and, and so I, I, I applied to various tertianship places, Chicago and Australia. No one would take me. In fact, I was going to go down to uh, El Salvador. I don't even speak Spanish, you know. But the provincials said, we're not letting Father Fessio in our province. So, so I, went to, I went to Siberia, <laughs> Nova Sibirsk, actually, for most of my tertianship. But I did make a long retreat. I asked Father Delubac, would you direct me? And so. I spent 30 days, we went to Paris, picked him up, we took the train to Belgium, way beyond it's called, and for 30 days I had Father de Lubac as my personal spiritual director for the long retreat. By the way, 
That was not accepted by the Jesuits in my long ago. I had to make a third one. That wasn't good enough for them. Is this being recorded? Oh, well. <laughs> uh, so uh, I remember, I won't forget, the last thing you said, we're finished the retreat, you said, Père Fessio, allez en avant. Father Fessio, go forward. Move forward. Forward march type thing. Okay, we did that with Ignatius Press. We expanded from those books on these great authors. Tony Ryan, our marketing director, brought in films and, uh, for uh, family, Catholic and family-oriented films. We began to do controversial things. We actually, a long story behind that, but, but we actually translated the Catechism of the Catholic Church because the other translation was woke already before the time. So we got involved in controversy, but we've seen that these books we've done by these great authors are terrific for priests, seminarians, religious, educated lay people, uh, you know, thought leaders and so on. But the number of people that can appreciate and read those books is dwindling. We have to get to the young people, you know. We, I'm not going to convert Nancy Pelosi. I'm sorry, I'm right near her home right here, but it's not worth the time going down there and talking to her. She's not going to change her mind. But young kids who are still innocent and we want to keep them innocent, despite the fact that we heard from these, in these pride parades, we're coming for your children, you know. Well, I got news. We're coming there. We're getting there first, okay. We want to we help the kids. So we've developed a whole uh, series of children's books, catechetical works, and we're partnering with Magnificat for these children's books, beautiful ones from, from France. Uh, we're partnering with Augustine Institute for a catechetical series, uh, and I'll tell you about another partnership just in a minute. But... Uh, We've tried to move forward, you know, with things that would help the church. What's, what's our criteria at, at Ignatius Press when we decide to do a book or not? Because we all pass them around and manage them. Do we like it? Does it help the church? That's all we want to know. Do we like it? Of course, we're bibliophiles, so we don't like things which aren't good books. Just one little other anecdote here during this period of time. Uh, Cardinal Schoenborn was a classmate of mine. Uh, with Ratzinger in, in Regensburg back in 1973, not 72 or 73. And uh, he told me that uh, he was at an audience with, with Pope Benedict when Gwendolyn Herter was present. She's the daughter of the family, uh, the Herter family, which is a great Catholic publisher in, uh, in Germany. And she was the president of Crossroads or Crossways, uh, which was their, their affiliate here in the United States. And she asked Pope Benedict, Pope Benedict, why is it you only publish with Ignatius Press? And he said, because when no one cared about me or knew me, they published me. Great loyalty he had. Now, of course, also in 1995, I wrote him a letter saying, could we have the rights to all your books in the future? You wrote back, yes, of course. I got that, got that letter there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, their legacy, the legacy of Benedict, which is part of the legacy of communio theologians, of de Lubach and von Balthasar, is our legacy, all right, of Ignatius Press. We have those books by these authors who are very deep, often difficult to read, uh, for the classes that need those kinds of books for nourishment, okay? But now we've also expanded for the children, we want to help the children in all these different ways. So that's, that's our legacy. And he said, well, what about my legacy? I'm here to talk about my, and also partly yours, too. Um, I'm 82, all right? And I don't want to cling to this life because I think something better is ahead. I've got to pass through some fire before I get there. But, uh, and I've been 51 years a priest. So I'm not going to be here for that much longer. I want to make sure Ignatius Press can not just stick around and have this legacy of these officers present for coming generations. I want us to grow. And so the purpose of this talk is what I will call friend raising. I'm not going to ask you for money for Ignatius Press, but you come here, all of you have good connections with other people who love the church. Many of them love Ignatius Press. And I want to build a network of people that join us at different, different levels. It can be just prayer. It, it, I say just prayer. It can be prayer. It can be 10 bucks once a, once a year. It could be more than that. It could be a big major gift. I don't care. But to be part of the team, part of the family, part of the legacy. And so uh, I'm going to show you a little film in a second to kind of 
digest in maybe five minutes what I just said in 40 minutes, but uh, we, this year for the first time, because we've never been a fundraising outfit, we engaged the American Philanthropic, now called Amphil, they're all here, they're, they're, they're circulating around the whole campus here, uh, and they hired for us a Charlie Goodwin, a young man who had been seven years in the Norbertines in, in Los Angeles, and good friend of Father Buckley too. Uh, and, you know, he's our fundraising help, major gift officer, that sort of thing. And we're gonna pass around these cards. All we're asking is if you're interested in talking to Charlie, or if you're willing to have Charlie talk to you about leads you have, ideas you have, people we should talk to, uh, then uh, I appreciate if you do that. Uh, Final word, uh, I know there's many good organizations that like to have endowments. There's nothing wrong with them exactly. I don't like endowments, so I don't want to sit on money that we could be using. The Ignatius Press, we're not for profit, but that doesn't mean we don't sell things. And so what I want to do is make sure that we can uh, produce things, create things, which themselves will be profitable and give us a stronger fund. And the two things we're working on now, which are really important, one with the Gusson Institute, uh, is this Word of Life catechetical series. We are going to challenge the behemoths out there, the secular publishers doing so-called Catholic things. They're more Catholic now because the Bishops Committee has been much more active in reviewing catechetical materials. But you know, we, we want to have a much better, combined with all the video resources of, of formed and the Gusson Institute, this, this is going to be, we believe, I mean, a, Tremendous, have a tremendous, we've already had our first year of full sales, we have 500 parishes that are picking this thing up. So it's, it's, it's growing, but we're not finished it yet. We got six to eight we have to do, and it's expensive. It's a $12 million project, and we put our excess in there. We ran out of excess, so we, now we need some more. Uh, so that's one thing. But the second thing is actually, in a sense, more, more exciting. Probably all of you have heard of scholastic books, because when you went to grammar school, you had these scholastic book fairs, <coughs> has scholastic book clubs and so on. It's been around since 1921. They have wholesome things, good things for children. They are a $1.6 billion company. They sell 30% of the children's books in the United States, and they've gone woke. So they still have a lot of the good books. because They get hundreds and hundreds of titles, but they've got many, many books which are overtly uh, LGBTQ, plus, 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 uh, woke stuff, uh, zombie stuff, uh, horror things. <coughs> really, it's horrible. And so, they're in Catholic schools. Well, before COVID, Ignatius Press said, hey, we're gonna start our own book club, which we did. <coughs> Called the Ignatius Book Club for Schools. But then COVID came, we shut it down, and we now have found this great couple in Florida, Liz and Adolfo Lantigua. They have a thing called uh, Good News Book Fairs and Book Clubs, and they put their life savings into this thing. And it's small, but it's already profitable. And it's, they, they can't handle all the requests they have, so we're gonna partner with them 50-50. We're gonna provide the capital, if we get the capital, but we're gonna, we're gonna get, we got some already, but uh, we want to displace scholastic book clubs and book fairs from Catholic schools and from Christian schools and from classical schools. We don't want these people coming after our children with these books which, which poison them. We want to give them the books which nourish them and strengthen their faith. So those are the two big projects we have. So we're going to conclude. I want to introduce Charlie Goodwin. He's right there. There, now, if you, now you know who to avoid if you want to avoid him. <laughs> and we, we've got these, he'll pass these cards out during the little film, and we've got more of them over at our, our book table there. And if you have friends that weren't here at this talk, please have them come by and we'll give them a card. But Charlie, uh, roll it. There's a table for Ignatius Press, and so if you have the time to fill out one of these mission cards, if you could return it to the table, or if you see me, you could hand it to me. That would be greatly appreciated, so thank you. Charlie, we want names, contacts. Who, who are you? <laughs> I'm Mark Brumley. Um, we want names and contacts, but we also want ideas, because we know that the people that read Ignatius Press books, they get great ideas. In fact, a lot of things that we're doing now have come from people out there like you. So uh, please, if you have great ideas for projects or people you know, 
please put those on there as well. Especially if they make money too. Okay. <laughs> and again, the idea is simply that um, I would love to meet with you and that's why I'd love to get your information. So enjoy this video and I'll pass these around the room. Thank you. The origin of Ancient Press has a long history and quite a story that begins in France. As a young Jesuit not yet ordained, I was in Fourvière, and there I got to know Father Henri de Dubac, one of the truly great theologians of the 20th century, a wonderful Jesuit, terrific person, and he was my mentor. I asked him at a certain point where I should do my doctoral studies and what I should do them on. He said, I propose you do your studies on Father Hans Roson Balthazar, the greatest theologian of our time and perhaps all time. He said, well, go to Regensburg, there's a young theologian there, Father Joseph Ratzinger, because de Lubach was a friend of Ratzinger's and a mentor too, wrote him on my behalf. And so I did my doctoral studies in Germany on Balthazar under the direction of Father Ratzinger, who became, of course, as we know, Cardinal Ratzinger and then Pope Benedict XVI. Father Joseph Fascio founded Ignatius Press along with Carolyn Lemon in the late 70s with the idea of bringing to the American reading Catholic audience the great works of people that Father Fascio studied with or about in Europe. So Hans Urs von Balthasar, Louis Bouillet, Joseph Ratzinger, Henri de Lubac. These were seminal figures that he wanted to make sure the American reading public had access to. It was pretty obvious that we were going to have to found a press of our own if we really wanted to do what we hoped to do. And so that was Father Fessio's inspiration. We have now published everything under the Catholic sun. So what does that mean? That means a beautiful line of children's books that we co-published with Magnificat of France. And then plus we have books on apologetics, books on prayer, the Ignatius Bible, a religious education series, Faith and Life, and now the Word of Life. Novels, we even published many novels, great books of literature. And here we are now, 45 years later since Father started Ignatius Press, and certainly one of the largest Catholic publishers in the English-speaking world. Ignatius Press is a huge operation. We got warehouses, we work on films, we do distribution, but also our whole office is just a tiny little firehouse in the middle of San Francisco with just about 15 people. We receive manuscripts, books, and we decide whether or not we want to publish them, and then we edit them to death, and then we publish them. It's my job to make sure the art looks good. My concept for the art is that God is beautiful, the faith is beautiful, so we want to portray that aspect, that beauty, and draw people to God and, and to our faith. We have a group of people who love books and love the church. And we get hundreds of manuscripts every year. And so we review them together. And what we decide upon is, will this help the church? And do we like it? Well, here at Ignatius Press, we're a family, and communal prayer is one of the highlights of working here. I mean, where else can you go to have daily mass? And we always get together to pray the Angelus, afternoon prayer, they also have morning prayer, and it really keeps us together. It keeps us focused on what's important. Definitely, the prayer life of Ignatius Press is very important, especially to its success. We've taken trips together. We have a retreat house that we go up and spend time together on the weekends. It's definitely more than just a job. There's definitely a, a sense of mission and an apostolate, and it certainly adds a large element to the character of our jobs here. Well, I love the work that I do. I edit books, and I really love that. But that work separated out from the relationships wouldn't be nearly as rewarding. We've been here now almost 30 years. It's the relationships with people that are so meaningful that make the work really worthwhile. What's turned out, however, is that Ratzinger, the Lubach, and Balthasar, their works will be works for a long time. So on one hand, I think our legacy will be to continue keeping those books in print, publishing secondary literature on them, and then the second part of the legacy will be continuing to support families in the education of their children and helping to bring up another generation of Catholics who will be strong in their faith.
My greatest hope for Ignatius Press in the future is for fidelity in mission, that we continue to be faithful to the gospel and to the truth of the church, and that we also continue this great legacy of authors that we have. To supporters of Ignatius Press, thank you for what you do. Please know that we appreciate it, and we see it as part of our mission to be faithful to the vision that you had in supporting Ignatius Press. In Ponte, Eucharist Estate, in all things, give thanks. So I think that's the charism I've had is to be grateful because of all the people that, that work here, the people that buy our books, and people support us. So thanks be to God and thanks to you.